Hello, my name is John Carew and I'm a senior at Middlebury College. I study comparative literature and public health and I'm so excited for this opportunity to speak with a Middlebury College grad today. In light of current events, this interview today is part of a series on careers in public health and part of the MidVantage program. It is my pleasure to introduce you all to Seth Crew, a member of the Middlebury College class of 2002. Seth is the Associate Director for Policy in the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Currently, as part of the CDC's novel coronavirus emergency response, he serves as at the policy lead for CDC's health systems response in a worker safety task force, and was recently the deputy policy lead for the CDC emergency response. Previously, Seth was the lead special assistant to the CDC director, and he also worked in policy roles in various emergency responses, including the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2018 to 2019, the Zika emergency response in 2016, and West African Ebola emergency response in 2014 to 2016. Seth joined the CDC as a Presidential Management Fellow in 2012, and he is a Master's of Public Administration from the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University. Welcome, Seth. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. I was hoping that we could begin um, with you telling us a little bit about what the public health industry is like and some of the various types of careers available in the industry. Sure. As you noted, um, my job focuses on the policy aspects of public health, um, and that involves a lot of interactions with state policymakers, so governors, state legislators, as well as uh, congressional audiences, congressional members, congressional staffers, and then working with other U.S. government agencies. Um, so I highlight that because I think that shows a, a different non-clinical track to work in public health. Obviously, clinicians, um, scientists, folks with medical degrees, PhDs in epidemiology, masters in public health are essential for careers in public health. But I think just as essential are other tracks um, with kind of a policy analysis mindset and a, a communication mindset with these other decision makers to, to work alongside of the clinicians and the scientists. So I think it's important to highlight that there are both clinical and non-clinical aspects to work in public health, um, which are equally important at the moment. Could you tell me a little bit more about kind of the day-to-day -day of your position of working with um, healthcare policy or health policy at the CDC? Sure. Right now, um, it's a little different than my normal day-to-day -day as part of the emergency response, which has been ongoing for the last couple months. Um, it's a fast-paced environment. They are long days, six to seven days a week at the moment. Um, and what it really involves is a lot of coordination. So coordination with members and staff in congressional offices to explain to them what we're doing, to answer their questions, um, to work with them to get the resources we need to do our jobs. Uh, coordination with other government agencies um, like FEMA, like the White House, like the Department of Homeland Security, like the Department of State for International Issues, to make sure we're all on the same page and working within our respective lanes to complement the work of others. And then a lot of coordination with state policymakers as well, as, uh, governors, state legislators, um, to coordinate the assistance that they need. So it's a lot of moving pieces, keeping those pieces um, moving in the right direction and making sure we're aware of what the others are doing to kind of all move in the same direction. Okay. Why did you choose to go into this field? Or, you know, is there a specific moment or a specific experience from which you draw your inspiration um, to do this kind of work? Yeah, it was, it was a, a bit of a winding path. I did not enter public health right away after graduating Middlebury. Um, I graduated Middlebury in 02, and my first job was in D.C. And I'll take a moment to kind of explain how I got to that first job, because I think it's an important lesson for Middlebury um, current students and recent grads. Uh, I was a, an international studies major with a focus in political science and Latin American affairs. Um, my thesis advisor at the time during my senior year, Professor Mark Williams, um, always did a great job of organizing lectures um, on Friday afternoons at about 4 p.m. Um, that was not the most popular time for people to attend lectures with guest speakers from, from outside the college, um, but they were fantastic. So it was a boon to those that did make the time on a Friday afternoon before getting the weekend started to, to go to those events. 
he told me, you know, I know you're looking for a career in research once you leave Middlebury and possibly in a think tank in DC. I have such a person coming to speak to us from a think tank in DC called the Inter-American Dialogue, which is gonna be right up your alley. So you really need to be here this Friday at four o'clock to go to this lecture. You should come prepared. You should engage and ask some questions. Also, by the way, there's gonna be a smaller dinner uh, a couple hours later after the lecture and only a select number of faculty and students are gonna be invited to that. So you're gonna to go to that as well. Um, I'm gonna give you a seat next to our guest and you're gonna bring your resume with you and chat him up because this is gonna be your ticket to try and get um, introduced to this field. So I followed his good advice um, and I, I had a great relationship with him from taking advantage of his office hours throughout the years. Um, I attended the lecture, I went to the dinner, I sat next to the guest speaker, I took his business card, he took my resume, and uh, we corresponded a bit, and um, by the time I graduated, I had a summer internship lined up in D.C. with that organization, which uh, at the end of the summer turned into my first job post-college in D.C. So that was on research and international affairs. A couple years after that, I changed a bit and started working in direct social service work. Mm -hmm. um, for another five or six years and then eventually moved with my family down to Atlanta, went back to graduate school and considered staying in kind of the, the nonprofit management sector or social service sector, but did some more thinking and kind of was able to marry up the two paths, the, the research and policy that I had done more early on and how it directly impacts people's lives um, in a community setting. And that's kind of how I found my way into public health um, and it focused primarily at first on preparedness and response and disaster management. Um, so it was a bit of a winding path, but now I've been at CDC for the last eight years in, in similar capacities. I so appreciate your mention of the various ways that your work is tied to community engagement, because I feel like that's been such a big part of my experience at Middlebury. Were you able to take advantage or did you have any specific community engage, either research projects or volunteer projects um, that you took on at Middlebury? You know, at, not so much at Middlebury, to be honest, but more post Middlebury after that first job when I became more interested in some of the community engagement work. Um, I managed um, a couple different nonprofit programs that worked with immigrants and youth, um, both in DC and then later in Atlanta. Um, and I am now, again, a bit removed from that. Um, so I have to kind of keep the lens that the policies I'm working on do impact communities and individuals, it's just several steps removed. So it's a, I, I just have to keep that in mind a bit. Do you um, keep anything in mind regarding the, when you're working with a community that's maybe um, different from your own community or your own background, um, what are some strategies or what do you think are the most important things to keep in mind? Um, and I ask that as someone who's, you know, interested in pursuing public health and marrying my interest in public health with languages I study, and having hesitation with working, you know, outside of the U.S. or in communities that I'm not as familiar with, um, because I won't have the same um, impact or the same cultural background um, to be able to work productively with them. Yeah, at CDC, we're fortunate that it's a, a very large organization with a wide breadth and um, a very deep experience as well. So we have the the luxury of having many people um, with experience working in many different environments. Um, so we can use that to our advantage and always work um, in teams um, on different projects so that we get the experience of those that have worked in other environments with different communities. So I think that's something very helpful, always being open to feedback from other people as well. You know, um, maybe when you're in college, you are working on a thesis or uh, another paper, you might have a couple people edit it. Um, and over the course of a long amount of time, whereas at work, I write a two page document and it gets edited by like 15 people. So that's something to get used to um, at first, but then you do get accustomed to welcoming that feedback because everyone does have a different amount of expertise in different areas and different background, which really help um, whatever product you're working on reach the broadest amount of people. Amazing. Um, I'd like to return a little bit to your path to where you are now. And when I was going through your, you know, your um, CV and your background, you mentioned taking part in the Presidential Management Fellows Program. And I think um, I'd love to hear more about it and how it led to where you are now and how it can um, help, you know, with careers in government in general. 
Yeah, that's something I'm very passionate about. I think that um, the presidential management program or fellowship is one of the best ways to get into government work. Um, so for those of you that don't know about it, yeah, you do have to have or be in the process of completing a graduate degree, whether that's a master's or JD or PhD. Uh, you can apply during your last year of um, work in graduate school. It's a two-year program. Um, you apply government-wide. Um, it's a, a rigorous application process with many steps along the way. Once you are accepted um, to this fellowship government-wide, you then go into kind of a more traditional job search within the federal government. Most agencies across the government take advantage of it. It's highly respected. Um, and there's a great alumni network across the agencies of people that came into government um, through the Presidential Management Fellowship, stayed in government for 20 years and are now leaders in their respective organizations. So it, it has fantastic networking opportunities and the, the fellows and alumni tend to really help each other and look out for each other. And it's meant to groom the next um, cohort of government leadership. Uh, that being said, um, it is a, a, a really competitive program, but I think it's, it's a great way to get in. You advance quickly, um, you get a lot of great experience after your two-year fellowship, you're eligible to convert uh, into permanent government employment, so you seamlessly just kind of roll in if you choose to stay. Um, and I, I think it's just a, a fantastic pathway and much easier than the traditional usajobs.gov um, kind of open application process. So I highly recommend those of you that are thinking about master's degrees or other higher education after Middlebury to really consider once you're in that last year of graduate studies to if you are interested in government work at all, take a look at the Presidential Management Fellowship Program. What types of master's or other advanced degrees are you think necessary or important for getting into the line of work you did? And I think I ask that as someone who kind of has had this conception for a long time or maybe a misconception that oftentimes people who work at the CDC have a type of clinical degree or have um, you know, an MPH. Um, so seeing your work as an MPA, um, could you speak somewhat to that, please? Sure, that's also something I'm pretty passionate about. Obviously, we need the MDs, we need the PhD epidemiologists, we need the laboratory uh, scientists at CDC and other public health organizations. I think it's, Equally important, we have the people that know how to work on budgets. We have the communicators that communicate with the public audiences. And we have the people that can work with congressional audiences or state and local decision maker audiences. So I think really having that breadth of experience makes any public health organization a stronger agency. Um, so I always tell people, don't be deterred if you don't have the clinical background. Um, there is a role for you, most likely, at a public health organization in, in a variety of settings um, to support the work of the scientists and the doctors that are at the forefront of that work. You might be a little bit more behind the scenes, but it's still integral to the work of many agencies. Cool. Thank you. Um, you mentioned um, you know, these positions that might be open for people who have advanced or master's degrees. Are there any entry-level positions that you can think of or people interested in getting into this field? What's a good... Um, I mean, you mentioned your work after undergraduate. Um, would you recommend that? Are there other options? Yeah, specifically at CDC, there is a great program called the Public Health Associate Program. It's sort of like a mini presidential management fellowship program, but just for CDC, not government-wide, and just for those um, finishing their undergrad degree. Um, I recommend people take a look at that. It places you for a couple of years either at CDC or sponsored by CDC at a state and local public health department. So that's a great way to get a taste of the field and see if it, it is something that one wants to continue working in. Um, also, at the moment, if one does go to usajobs.gov, you'll see a big banner that uh, government-wide, there's a lot of hiring going on for um, some permanent positions and some temporary, say, year-long positions to help in the novel coronavirus emergency response, both at CDC and other agencies. So I would take a look at those, and I think a lot of those will be based um, not in D.C. or in Atlanta, where CDC is, but also at... Uh, out in the field throughout the country to help with that emergency response. So I think those are two good things to check out for someone that wants to, to take a look at the public health career right out of undergrad. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, that banner advertising, you know, positions related to the novel coronavirus response. Um, do you see um, kind of longer term ramifications for the public health industry um, regarding the current pandemic? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And to be clear, this would be my own opinion, um, not the opinion of the CDC or the, the US government. But I think um, it's hard to predict what ramifications there could be. There may be um, increased focus on the importance of public health and building public health capacity at the state and local level and at the federal level. Um, I think if that were to be the case, that could be a long-term um, benefit to the, the field of public health to increase the capacity of public health infrastructure to do its job. Thank you. Um, I think now in more of a general sense, I'd like to ask if there are any other pieces of advice that you'd like to offer for you know, individuals at the college pursuing public health or careers in policy, um, whether you would offer similar advice for people looking for things in those you know, both industries um, or if they would be the same pieces of advice. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to something I said earlier. One, take advantage while you're still at Middlebury of the professors and their networks and their office hours. I mean, that was purely the way I got my first job out of Middlebury. And since then, um, that has helped me along the path. So keep in touch with your professors, get to know them, take advantage of small settings where you can chat with them. That's extremely important. Um, and I always emphasize that to people. Um, the second thing I would say is pursue multiple paths at the same time. If, for example, someone is really focused on international relations and their dream is to work at the State Department, that's really difficult to do out of the gate. Um, don't let that discourage you. There are many other organizations that you can work in and gain experience in international fields, for example, that may eventually lead you to your dream job at the State Department. Same thing with CDC. If your dream is to work there, but you're not able to get your foot in the door right out of college or right out of grad school, look at state and local health departments, look at uh, non-governmental organizations that work in the field to gain more experience and then work your way um, towards kind of your, your dream or your goal. So don't get discouraged along the way. Look at multiple paths and be open to an organization or an agency or an entity that maybe was not the first at the top of your list where you want to end up, but will help you get there eventually. Thank you. I know, you know, thinking about entering the job market and whatnot um, right after undergrad, um, there are some of my peers and some of my friends are thinking about pursuing fellowships or other international research or international learning or international teaching opportunities for a couple of years before returning to the U.S. and diving into a master's program or a job um, or a career. Do you have any advice or any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a great path. And that kind of goes along with what I, I previously said about being open to new experiences. I mean, those are phenomenal programs, all the different fellowships that you just referred to and research opportunities that will only help someone gain more experience and be a more attractive candidate for whatever they want to do after that. And I encourage people to take advantage of fellowship type opportunities while they're still uh, while they're actually working as well after they've um, kind of joined the workforce. I recently took part in a part-time fellowship run by um, Johns Hopkins University Center for Health Security out of their School of Public Health, which was uh, a great fellowship that brought together kind of mid-level people across government, across nonprofit sectors and the private sector that all worked on similar public health preparedness and response issues and, and brought us together for a series of networking events over the course of a year, which was fantastic. So I, I always encourage people to take advantage of things that can further research, give them new experiences and bring them in contact with other people to, to expand their network. Well, thank you. Um, can you speak at all to the intersections between your work at the CDC or government work in general and the private sector or ways that you might have worked with private sector entities in the past, whether in designing responses to the outbreaks you've worked on or in designing policy? Yeah, that's a good question. One of, um, in the, the most recent role I held in this current emergency response um, was on our, what we call our policy unit within the, the Emergency Operations Center. And a lot of that work is coordination and communication with the private sector. So whether that is um, pharmaceutical companies, diagnostic test manufacturing, um, entities, um, producers of other critical supplies. It really is essential that each knows what the other is doing and can coordinate. Um, so I think that that always comes up. It's, it's extremely important that the government sector stays in touch with the nonprofit sector as well as the private for-profit sector as well. Thank you. Um, I think finally, I wanted to ask about the most gratifying part of your work um, or what is it that drives you every day? I think 
at the moment, uh, especially during the emergency response, which is kind of like the furthest I can look at the at the moment um, while working on it, is knowing that hopefully in some small way, my individual piece of this massive government-wide international emergency response contributes to helping reduce illness and death um, in some way due to, to coronavirus. So sometimes it's hard to focus on the bigger picture when we're focused on our very small piece of it. But I just try and kind of remember after the day is over that hopefully something I did today in some small way contributes to the larger picture to get to the end of the pandemic and, and keep people safe and healthy. Thank you for that. Um, is there anything in closing that you'd like to share that I didn't ask about um, any other advice, any other takeaways that someone should take from this? I think one of the things that has really helped me in my career is having a liberal arts background um, and the education from Middlebury. One of the skills that I rely on most as a non-clinician working among many clinicians and scientists and doctors is the ability to quickly read lots of information from different sources synthesize that information, uh, form thoughts and opinions and analyses of that information, and then present that information to a wide variety of audiences, whether it's the public, whether it's a congressman, whether it's a congressional staffer, governor, governor's office, et cetera. Um, the ability to gather that information, quickly assimilate it, develop sort of my own thoughts about it, and then present it back tailored to the audience that I'm talking to or writing to, I think is something that I really gained from a liberal arts education due to you know the amount of reading that you're doing, the amount of quick turnaround writing that you're doing in a, in a liberal arts school like Middlebury. So I think that is something that people should keep in the back of their mind too. take advantage of that unique aspect of your education, whether you do go into scientific work or non-scientific work after, it really does um, form a basis of what I use every day in my role. Mm. And then briefly, um... Are there, have you come across opportunities to use languages um, or non-English languages in your work um, in, you know, reading these vast quantities of information or presenting um, or any of your colleagues? Um, is that involved with the type of work you do? Yeah, for me, not so much on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment. Um, not for lack of opportunity at CDC, for example. We have a, an enormous Center for Global Health that has offices in over 50 countries. Um, with people permanently stationed in those countries. So there is a real need for people that have um, both the, the technical skills in public health there, um, as well as the language to accompany it when they work overseas. Um, just in, in my day-to-day -day role, I don't use it as much, um, which I miss a little bit. I, I do speak Spanish. I studied that at Middlebury. I studied abroad my junior year, which I also highly encourage everyone to do. Um, so I, I hope to get back to that at some point. Um, it came in handy recently. I went with the CDC director and the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services to Peru for a couple days um, for some work. So it was an added bonus that I could help navigate some of the things um, during our meetings there. That sounds amazing. Thank you, Seth, for speaking with us today. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. I'll definitely be on the lookout for more episodes in this series. Thank you so much. Thanks, it was my pleasure.